So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good evening. Uh, good morning. We actually had somebody from the Far East with us today. Uh, so they're already tomorrow, if I understand it correctly. Um, and um, welcome to the 74th monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group. Uh, we are recording today's meeting, uh, hosted at uh, the Ontario College of Art and Design University in Toronto, Canada. Uh, and uh, if you do not wish to be recorded, you should leave now. Um, I'm going to, my name is Anthony Upward, I'm one of the co-founders of the group uh, and I'm just going to spend a few minutes introducing the group. M many of you on the call are, are very familiar with the group, others this is your first meeting and welcome. Um, if you wish to uh, know who else is here, uh, we tend not as our norm to do introductions, rather we record who's here in our wiki, uh, which is, uh, Nicole has been busy adding all the people in attendance to that uh, and uh, has put the link to the wiki in the chat. Actually, we can't put it in the chat so you can see it on the screen. Um, so, uh, with that, let me uh, go to my presentation and get this into presentation mode. Really. So, uh, we are as a group exploring how to enable entrepreneurs and established businesses to realize enterprises that choose flourishing as their goal. Uh, and this is the work of uh, the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group Global Community of Innovation Practice since uh, 2012. That's when we started uh, this uh, journey together. Um, I want to start by a quick acknowledgement. This is something that we now do as a matter of practice in Canada uh, as we're part of uh, our truth and reconciliation process with the First Nations who were here in Canada before uh, us settlers. Uh, and uh, I've uh, altered this to be relevant uh, so that to a global audience. And so uh, I invite you to consider what I'm about to say from where you are. So this is sacred land on which each of us are privileged to be today. This land nearby lakes and the sea has supported human beings for thousands of years and is rich in history, knowledge and tradition. We are privileged to be the beneficiaries and the stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the seven generations to come and beyond. And I, we invite you to consider in your place how you honor and respect people's indigenous to your place, which of course could well be you yourself. Today, each place around the world is increasingly a home to people from across the world, and we're each grateful to have the opportunity to bear, be where we are today. Um, I just want to let you know where we are physically, uh, and I invite you to also think about this question do you know what watershed you are in? Uh, here in Toronto, uh, for us sitting in the room, we're sitting on the edge of a watershed known by the settlers as Russell Creek. Uh, we buried that in the 1870s uh, to become a sewer. Uh, I've been looking for the indigenous name and haven't been able to names and haven't been able to find it yet. So if anybody has an insight on that, I'd be very pleased to do here. Uh, the delivery of this session, uh, where, wherever you are, is important on place. Uh, think about just at a basic level if you visit the bathroom. Uh, before, during, or after, where that connects to, uh, the answer is the watershed. And of course, for those of you using the Flourishing Business Canvas, the watershed is a vital collection of what on the canvas is represented by biophysical stocks and solar powered ecosystem services. Uh, so, up to the update uh, to uh, the request of a couple of people when we were just uh, convening. So, we are now 1,400 people. We are the world's first. Has perhaps the world's only group taking action to undertake enterprise strategy into organizational design action research from a micro ecological economic perspective. Uh, using systemic design approaches, uh, the group is likely to become the first um, uh, group within the newly formed uh, Association of Systemic Design or Systemic Design Association, which was uh, launched at the seventh systemic design uh, symposium that was held this year in uh, Turin, Italy, uh, a couple of weeks ago. So we're like the first uh, sort of uh, topic specific systemic design group. Uh, we have a strong normative purpose, unlike many research group, research and practice groups, we actually uh, are trying practically to enable flourishing. Uh, and we get you. So for those of you who have been looking for a home uh, for your work, uh, this is, we think you found, we hope you found us, we found you. Uh, so uh, our members actually put into practice and do action research around the latest ideas. So uh, we have now two uh, strong uh, students from the OCAD uh, strategic um, foresight and innovation program, SFI. Uh, and uh, so this is a message for them partly. And we offer a global network of possibilities for your education, research, and indeed employment. Recently. 
Uh, won't go through this slide in detail. These slides will be in the uh, Google Drive folder for today's meeting, along with the recording, as well as the main slides. So I won't go through all this. Uh, just to let you know, we are part of a growing financial movement. Uh, I'm expecting the slide to get very much more crowded very soon. Uh, and of course, we're in sync with and going beyond the UN SDGs. So the UN SDGs are a gift of humanity from humanity, an amazing achievement. First time we as a species have had a, a shared goal at the planetary level. Uh, however, it's also a political compromise and therefore it's actually not achievable based on the science. There's, there's inherent conflicts between some of the goals. So that's why we say we want to go beyond the goals. That's what Strongly Sustainable is all about. Uh, we have multiple projects of our members going on, of which uh, the six major ones are listed on the screen. Uh, we have uh, two more uh, in the process of getting going. Uh, one uh, which I, which anybody's uh, interested in, and maybe today uh, uh, another new one may get started. We'll, we'll see how the conversation goes. Um, these are projects of our members, by our members. The group is just there to, as a container, as a community. It's up to our members to self-organise, and hopefully our new community animators will be able to help uh, improve the, our efficiency and effectiveness doing that. Uh, so uh, just a few other connections to make, uh, particularly this first one. Uh, our speaker today, our main speaker today, Florian Ludeco Freund, is the, uh, one of the lead conveners of the conference series, uh, which will be actually, I think this is its fourth, not fifth, I got that one on the slide, uh, conference in Berlin uh, next year on new business models. And uh, many of us will be there at that conference, so we hope, hope to see many of you there as well. Uh, also, uh, I've just already mentioned this, this was in Turin last week, uh, and this is another, this is, if you like, from a, a uh, uh, research methods perspective, our containing uh, area of practice, uh, our containing home. Uh, reporting 2.0 has issued this uh, blueprint on business models, so we're connected to them very much and they're self identifying. Florian and uh, Christian have uh, published a fantastic uh, article on setting out our feel uh, and uh, exploring whether it's just a passing thing or, in fact, a, a big new thing. Obviously, we think it's a big new thing. Uh, we've got Florian who also maintains our blog for us uh, and also we're uh, home to many of the people in the academic b community as well as uh, we're connected to the Canadian Academy for Sustainable Innovation. Uh, these are some of the things that our projects have been, some of our projects have been doing uh, and I won't skip over this. Uh, we have the monthly meetings for sharing, this has been our signature event, uh, more to come uh, and uh, we are ready for graduate students to engage. In fact, Sarah uh, Carew is uh, who's one of the other presenters today is one of those people and we've had plenty of grad students involved. So if you're a professor, you're looking for opportunities for your grad students to engage with the global community, uh, we could be it. Um, and we need help. Uh, and I'm very happy to announce before I get to this that we have now secured some help for the first time uh, in uh, Bo Su, who's sitting next to me to my left, who's that camera should be pointing at you, but uh, let's get remote so you can see both. Um, and uh, the other person is um, Nicole Norris, who is sitting about 120 kilometers north of us today in Barrie, Ontario. Uh, so if I can get the camera to move, that's zooming out. There we go, there it's both. I don't know what it's angle, it's turn this right, it's fair. And we're a small group in the room today, so I suspect the snow has got in the way. Um, for people getting here. Uh, so, Bo and Nicole, if any of you, they're, they're now managers of the LinkedIn group, so you can all communicate with them directly through LinkedIn. You can also reach both of them by emailing animators at ssbng.com, and maybe, uh, Nicole, you'd like to put that into the chat. Uh, and uh, whatever you need, we're curious to know what you need from us, uh, and uh, if, you, if you need help, then reach out to them. Uh, they are volunteers, I'll stress. They are full-time, well, no, part-time graduate students at OCAD, uh, and they are both holding down uh, jobs uh, as well. Uh, so I think we all can appreciate that uh, what they're trying to do is help us. So we, we need to help them help us uh, by not uh, overloading them. And I include myself into, in that remark. So. so with that, I would like to hand over now to uh, Florian and the team of uh, his colleagues who have done this fascinating work on patterns of uh, sustainable business models. So, Florian, let me end the presentation, and Sarah, I think you're going to take over. Yes, um, thank you very much. I would just um, give a brief introduction before Sarah takes over, and um, that's the first part of the presentation. Uh, Anthony, first of all, 
thanks a lot for having us, for inviting us to this impressive 74th meeting. So um, just congratulations. I think you're doing an incredible job in facilitating this community now for five or six years. And to, um, yeah, to give it some, some um, consistency and just the opportunity to continuously work on that stuff that's so important to us. Um, so thanks a lot for this. Um, <laughs> yes, you can do that too. To, today we are presenting... Um, uh, sorry. Sorry? sorry? is just going to, uh, to model the behavior. So, so she's doing that for me and for you. Yeah. Okay, nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so the paper, uh, we're going to present today uh, has recently been published in a rather new journal which is called um, Sustainable Production and Consumption and it's kind of uh, let's say sister or brother maybe of the Journal of Cleaner Production and um, so they in fact invited a contribution from our group to this journal so um, they were quite positive about this topic um, related to, to business model patterns, sustainable business model patterns. And this topic goes back to, I, I would say, discussions that um, I had with you, Anthony, but also a lot with Alexandre, because to me as a social scientist, it's not the obvious thing to uh, think about and to research on patterns. Um, it, it's not the natural thing to do, but but I think you guys, you somehow brought this topic um, and made it very interesting to me and that's why uh, Alexandre and I started this debate, I would say it was 2015, by just realizing that there has been published so much about so many different business models which hold at least the promise or some potential um, to perform sustainably or better than other business model patterns that we decided to do this kind of review project and later on Sarah uh, joined this team and she did her master thesis, a really brilliant piece on sustainable business model patterns, which is also part of the paper. And um, so then we were happy to have Lorenzo Massa and also Henning Breuer to join the team to finally um, finish the paper and get it published in uh, this sustainable production and consumption um, journal. So that's kind of the short background story. And um, I'd like to hand over to Sarah to introduce the paper and our results. Um, hi everyone. I just wanted to check. Can everyone hear me properly? Otherwise, I would have to put my earphones in, but I'm assuming audio is okay. Okay. Well, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Crew. I'm a PhD researcher at the University of Hamburg. Um, I specifically work for the Chair of Management and, uh, and Sustainability, which is headed by Professor uh, Timo Bush. And if it weren't for this project and the support of Florian, I most probably wouldn't be in my PhD position right now. So uh, this, uh, this uh, project uh, plays a pivotal role in my life at, uh, in the past and in the present. Um, so I'm truly delighted that I was given the opportunity to present the paper that I co-wrote with Florian and with Alexandre and Lorenzo and Henning on uh, patterns for sustainability-oriented business model innovation. And uh, let me just jump right in. Um, so I'll start with my first slide. So. Nowadays, there exists a general consensus that for sustainable development to be achieved, corporate sustainability has to become a norm. And business model innovation has been identified as a promising approach for uh, fostering corporate sustainability. Interestingly enough, uh, business model patterns, which have been actually recognized as a valuable tool for facilitating business model innovation have only been examined by very few studies in the sustainability context. And this brings me directly to the research gap that we aim to fill. Um, so in sum, what is missing is a, a definition of the a term and concept sustainable business model pattern. Secondly, a consolidation of current knowledge on sustainable business model patterns, and last but not least, and probably also most importantly, a uh, pattern taxonomy that could be used to support business model innovation for sustainability. So, uh, basically to reach these um, research objectives, we start with the most basic question, and this is 
It was, what is a pattern? So uh, uh, the term pattern is typically borrowed from design research and architecture, most specifically from the work of the design theorist and architect Christopher Alexander, who defined a pattern as follows, quote, each pattern describes a problem which occurs over and over again in our environment, and then describes the core of the solution to that problem in such a way that you can use the solution a million times over without ever doing it the same way twice, end of quote. So in a nutshell, patterns are reusable proven solutions to reoccurring problems that are derived empirically and that are described in the encyclopological manner or a very formalized structure that is based on the structure proposed by Christopher Alexander. I'll get to that until in a little bit. Um, prominent examples of business model patterns can be found, for instance, in Osterbaumpreneur's uh, 2010 business model generation, where they, for instance, presented the razor and blade model. Other examples can be found in Gassmann et al.'s 2014 The Business Model Navigator, where they, for instance, introduced the Robin Hood model. And last but not least, Nancy Bakken and, and company 2015, uh, 14, sorry, uh, where they, per, for instance, also uh, present the slow fashion model. So what did we do to develop a taxonomy for uh, sustainable business model patterns? Well, we applied a multi-step, multi-method approach. Um, the five steps are the following. Firstly, we reviewed uh, sustainable business model literature. This resulted in the, the identification of 14 relevant publications that provided 102 potential sustainable business model patterns. In the second step, we filtered our obtained pattern sample by, for instance, eliminating duplicates and irrelevant items. And this resulted in the identification of a total of 45 sustainable business model patterns, which we then went on to describe in a very formalized fashion, which I'll show you on the other slide in a minute. And then, uh, thirdly, we conducted an internal sorting of the patterns into groups. This resulted in the identification of 12 initial pattern groups. In the fourth step, we performed what Paul 2008 refers to as a modified uh, Delphi card sorting. This resulted in the classification of the 45 identified patterns into 11 final pattern groups based on experts' consensus opinion. And last but not least, we issued a so-called values effects survey, which resulted in the linking of the identified SBM patterns into uh, and and as well as the pattern groups with uh, the three aspects of sustainable value creation uh, economic value social value and ecological value so for comprehension reasons i'm now going to dive a little deeper into explaining step four the modified delphi card sorting method as this was also basically my master's thesis and then Florian will move on and take over by going into more detail in regards to step five, the values effects survey. He'll then summarize the results and conclude the presentation. So, um, as I already said, in step four, we conducted a modified Delphi card sorting method based on Nepal 2008. Uh, this method basically combines the principles and strengths of uh, Delphi surveys and of card sorting exercises. Um, the key objective in this case being uh, consensus, consensus among the experts on how to classify the patterns into groups in a meaningful manner. So this exercise entailed the following. We asked 10 international experts 
to uh, participate independently of one another in an actual manual card sorting exercise. So this involved, and this is sometimes difficult for people to actually fathom, this involved 45 actual printed uh, business model cards and 12 actually printed uh, business model pattern uh, uh, pattern group cards, as well as a whole slew of um, supplementary material, including instructions with guiding questions. We had feedback documents. We had plank pattern cards that our experts could fill out and so forth. Uh, we basically bombarded them with a lot of paper. <laughs> and um, as shown on this slide, what you can see is um, each pattern card had a pattern name on the front and a pattern uh, description in the back, which formalized, followed a very formalized structure. So the dark gray area is basically the front cover of the card, the lighter gray area describes, oh, well, this is a little confusing, the light gray G8 social mission pattern that is the pattern group card as you can see in this case it has a um, pattern group name on the front and a one sentence pattern group description and right next to it which is the greater grayer a darker gray that is the pattern card in this case for a market oriented social mission it had a name on the front and a, a detailed description on the back as you can see below in the table and follow the structure context problem solution example, which is basically a condensed form of the structure proposed by Christopher Alexander. So as you can see, the key task of our experts was basically to assign the pattern cards to the group cards. And one of the key guiding questions was for which group label and description resonates the most with the problem solution combination described by the pattern. So here just to give you an idea of what the exercise looked like, this was sent to us by uh, an expert in our expert group. So a lot of paper, a very time and work intensive exercise. Um, we received very positive feedback from our experts. I was somewhat astounded about this, quite frankly, because the exercise itself, like I said, was very work and time intensive. And in general, we actually we had a little star system and uh, the most experts actually regard it as a very valuable learning experience for them. And they rated the whole exercise at least four to five out of five five stars, which we were very elated about. So in generally, what we found out through the feedback documents we received is that our experts in general adopted a very intuitive classification approach. And we were um, very fortunate that a consensus was reached after just two rounds of card sorting uh, in that sense, which was really nice for me personally because I had, was on a tight schedule for my master's thesis. So in that sense, I was a little bit, that that's more self-centered satisfaction. But um, it was also nice because due to the fact that they completed the exercise in just two rounds, they basically fulfilled the minimum requirement, which is demanded, uh, which has to be fulfilled for an effective Delphi survey. Um, and these rounds were conducted between uh, February and May of 2017. So uh, here you see an overview of the sustainable pattern groups that resulted from this exercise. Um, I don't know how well you can see the slides, but I hope you can see them quite well. Um, what you will see, well, basically to give you a little bit more background, what you see is how many patterns were allocated to the 11 groups. As you might remember, initially we started off with 12. Uh, our final number of groups was 11. So we actually eliminated a, a pattern group in the process and had largely to do with the group agreement weight, which you can see uh, in the right hand column. The group agreement weight basically indicates the consistency of the pattern set that makes up a, a particular group or in other words, the extent to which um, experts agree on the whole pattern composition of a given group. 
So what you'll notice in the left hand in the left hand column is that the numbering is off. And as I have mentioned, it's because one of the groups were excluded due to the fact that a very low group agreement weight was reached in the first round and it was so low that there didn't seem to be any potential for it to actually meet um, be a, go beyond the threshold that we had set after the second round and in terms of um, our what what the threshold that had to be reached in order for consensus to be uh, to be achieved so that being said I think I covered a base, the basics of the modified Delphi card sorting, and I would now hand over to Florian uh, to uh, introduce or explain or provide a summary of the values effect survey. Sure. Um, so I'm now revealing uh, classified information. Um, the table you've seen um, a few minutes before, it's Anthony's table. Um, so he was uh, willing to share a picture of his um, messy um, card sorting exercise. So thanks a lot for this uh, image, Anthony. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, as you've seen, so finally uh, 11 groups uh, resulted from this exercise and um, these groups represent kind of the expert consensus on, on the right place of, of each pattern. And um, so you, you kind of wonder, okay, these guys sorted a lot of pattern cards, um, but I think it's much more than just sorting cards. It's really about asking 10 international experts uh, with very different backgrounds and to see the consensus within this group emerge and this really is the contribution to, let's say, the production of, of, of common, of shared knowledge uh, in, in this complex domain in which so many patterns are being discussed in the literature. Um, so after this grouping exercise, we also did this value effects survey, which was step five of our multi-method approach. And the task for the experts, and it was the, the same 10 experts, was to associate uh, every single pattern to um, the three types of value creation which we present to the triple bottom line, which is economic value creation, ecological value creation, and social value creation. And um, we directly ask our experts to associate every pattern to one, two, or all three of these forms of value creation. And to support this exercise, uh, we send further information and guidelines, and this included, for example, the GRI's basic definition of these three forms of value creation. So we used the global reporting initiatives definitions because we assume um, that this is kind of a common sense definition, which is used in practice a lot, but you also see a lot of references in the academic world to global reporting initiative. So this was our way of handling this complex issue and question of what's finally sustainable value creation. So this was our workaround, our strategy to accomplish this task. And every expert had to assign um, one to 10 points to, to one, two or three forms of value creation. So if, if an expert, for example, thought in, in this case, let's look at P11, which is differential pricing, that this is more leaning towards economic value creation, then on average, the experts assigned 4.56 points to economic value creation, but they also thought that it has a lot of influence or a lot of potential to create social value. And so on average, our experts assigned 4.39 points to social value creation. And as you can see, they agreed on a very low uh, potential to create ecological value. Uh, for the case of this specific pattern that's called differential pricing. So then together with Alexander, we figured out or we found a way to not only have the experts put in the numbers into the table, but also to show the results in real time as real time feedback to, to the experts um, by means of this triangle, uh, which it showed after the exercise where the patterns are located relatively on the triangle. And the triangle is representing the triple bottom line, it's the sustainability triangle. 
with ecological, social and economic uh, pillars. And if we go one slide, if you move on, Sarah, or do I have the screen? No, okay. can you move on? So we need the next slide. One second, it seems, yeah, now it works. I have okay. time. So in our experts, um, in, in case they did their calculations correctly, so all for every pattern, it had to sum up to 10.0, so they had to do the numbers correctly. Uh, then this triangle, which was um, in an Excel file, showed the location. So this provided some kind of a visual reference. So, um, and we thought it, it makes a lot of sense to provide this kind of visual support um, to kind of make these relative judgments about the different patterns. So if these patterns now pop up on the triangle, maybe then people see it in, in the triangle and think, no, relatively sp speaking, maybe the patterns have to be m closer located more to the um, economic pillar or to the economic corner or maybe to the ecological corner. And you also got quite positive feedback that this really supported the exercise. And what you see here is um, group one, which is about pricing and revenue patterns. And you see the four patterns, P11 to P14, located on the triangle. And um, the group average um, summarizing all four patterns is marked as G1 on this triangle. And here you see that um, it's, it's quite a consistent group because it's located somewhere between social and economic and more leaning towards the economic. So this was, for example, um, the result um, for group one. So I think we can move on. Mm -hmm. So this is the group called closing the loop patterns. And this is also a very consistent group where you see that um, the nine patterns, which are related to circular economy approaches, um, are also located um, yeah, very close to each other. And they form this nice group around the average, which is marked G4, leaning more towards the ecological um, part of the triangle. We can move on. So in this, maybe Alexander, maybe, would you like to take over and explain this very nice triangle that you created? Just a spontaneous idea. Would, would you like to explain the triangle? Sure. Um, so uh, basically what we did is we took, uh, I think everybody hears me. If not, uh, let me know. So we took every point and we created a blob, a very scientific blob. This is more of a graphic representation where we want to make sure that all the points are, are represented. So we assigned a color to each pattern uh, group, and then we uh, made sure to color the zone that was touched by each um, different individual pattern. And then uh, we highlighted the center, the epicenter, as done in through the Excel. And uh, very simply, we, we arrived at this, uh, this shape. Another thing that we did before that, maybe I should have mentioned that we uh, named from A to J, the different forms of value creation. So we, we divided the triangle into different sections, which wasn't present for the participants, but was in our graphical representation. Um, as you can see in the center, there's a hexagon, which is the, um, the area that touches all three. Um, I think that, uh, that pretty much uh, goes around it. So uh, maybe the last thing I could mention again uh, is the, um, this, the shape of the triangle, how the further away we are from the, the, the top, um, the, uh, we, we go from strongly economic to partly economic to weak economic. And so there's a, a, a gradation as we move away from a, a, a certain pole. Did I do it justice, uh, Gloria? Thank you very much. Perfect. <laughs> um, okay, maybe next slide, Sarah. Okay, so that's kind of um, the co conclusions of our project, um, which which we think is um, is uh, making different contributions. So the first is that um, back in 2015, and now it's I think it's it just grew in the past few years, but back in 2015 we found 14 studies, 14 which um, presented different potential. 
sustainable or sustainability oriented business model patterns. And based on our manual review, we found 102 candidates and we were then able to reduce 102 candidates to 45. And um, this is kind of a consolidation work which took a lot of time and we see this really as a service to the research and practice community because now people have one reference list they can work with and they don't have to look up 14 different studies which all apply different languages. It were all published in English, but the way the patterns were presented is very different across these publications. So we not only synthesized and consolidated um, the content of these different studies, but we also offer, using the Alexandrian form, kind of a clear, consistent language um, to describe these 45 patterns. So that's, I think, a service that makes life easier for many people who are interested in using the patterns practically or scientifically. So the second contribution we would say is the methodology itself. So it took a lot of time to, to come up with a method that simply allowed us to, to, to engage experts, to, to share, to make experts share their knowledge and um, share their assessment of these different patterns. And we were discussing a lot of different approaches, including an online survey, uh, including interviews and all that kind of stuff. And um, then Alexandre found different methodologies and then we finally agreed on this um, physical card sorting exercise, which as Sarah said, um, worked pretty well and the experts really liked it. So this methodology is made, is, is described in a lot of detail in the paper so people can repeat this study and um, in, in science um, transparency and um, allowing people to repeat what has been done is very important. And um, so we offer a new method that other people can also use, but we also offer the opportunity to simply check if we did our job correctly and if it's solid what we've done. Um, and then it's another contribution relating to um, that, um, you, you know, in, in the SBM domain, a lot has been done and discussed around um, the archetypes from Nancy and colleagues, for example, but also other concepts that try to generalize approaches to SBMs. Um, but interestingly, there was no clear um, and solid connection between um, the notion of patterns um, and the underlying pattern theory. And again, thanks a lot to Anthony and Alexandra for introducing this stuff to me. Uh, and, and so this is kind of the third contribution that we see is that we make a clear and strong connection between the notion of patterns as it is used in design and architecture, but also in, in some branches of the social, social sciences and to connect it to the SBM field. And um, now we're offering this kind of a standardized language using the Alexandrian form, using pattern theory, that this holds the potential to create a kind of shared language. So we are, we're not saying this list is complete with 45, but what we are saying is, this could be a starting point, this could be a reference list. Um, the list of groups can be extended. And now we have a language and we have a, an approach to continue this work. So th this paper can also be, be read as an, as, an, as an open invitation to people who, who think, hey guys, 45, I have 90 more or whatever. So it's really, it's really an invitation to create this kind of language and so maybe an encyclopedia um, related to patterns. And I think this nicely connects to what Anthony had in mind when he started his work uh, many, many years ago um, to develop the ontology, the SSBMO. Uh, it, it can also become part of the handbook that the SSBMG is trying to create. So a lot of practical but also scientific uses. Um, and, um, uh, sorry, I thought you were coming to a pause. I, I have, I have a, a, a suggestion and a comment, but uh, I, I Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, please. Maybe just one last thing. Um, Sarah, uh, I think we have this evolution picture also in the slides. Do, do we have it? Mm, let me check. No, we no. don't, not on this one. Okay, but, but maybe I, I can summarize it. Um, so what we also found was that when, when Alexandre and I did this initial grouping exercise leading to 12 groups, it took us months to agree 
to, to have an agreement between the two of us on, on, on 12 initial groups. And um, so this is how typically literature reviews or conceptual papers are done, right? So authors agree on something and then they present it to the public. And the interesting thing is that the two of us, we agreed and could have published these 12 initial groups as the result of our research. But after presenting these 12 groups to the 10 international experts, the group composition fundamentally changed. So we have a very nice picture, Sarah compiled a very nice picture, which shows how the, how the single, the individual patterns moved across groups and finally found their final destination, one of, of the 11 groups. And this tells me that um, if it's just a group, a little group of authors who agree on pattern groups or other conceptual features, you must be critical or careful in using these concepts in this kind of a two person consensus. Um, because what we found in the initial 12 groups did simply not fit or did simply not represent what our 10 international experts were thinking, right? So this also told me that whenever you are doing research in a small group of researchers and authors, you should have kind of a mechanism to check for the external validity and, and consistency of your results. And this really, um, this picture is very nice. Maybe we can share it after, after this meeting. Um, this, this was really a surprising result, how different our interpretation of the groups was from the interpretation of our experts. So this really told me that expert consensus is really an important tool and mechanism to make sure that you're presenting um, externally valid and solid results. So that's kind of my personal reflection on this process. Here I can stop. Okay, okay. so uh, first of all, I, I, I want to uh, absolutely commend uh, the speakers for uh, summarizing an extremely uh, big piece of research so concisely in such a short space of time um, and, and it's leaving uh, plenty of time for discussion so uh, for those of you who are presenting in, in future months I, I commend you to uh, take this uh, approach. Um, so I, I think uh, to your invitation uh, Florian uh, there are a number of us uh, in, in, on the call today who, uh, who are keen to accept your invitation and to, to, to move, uh, move to the next stage of, of this research. Uh, and I certainly have some, some comments to that might provoke uh, that discussion. But before we do that, um, in, while we were uh, convening uh, just before 4.30 uh, local time here, uh, we had a quick rehearsal of something we thought we might try with the audience uh, and uh, now to actually test out the model. Maybe, maybe Sarah, if you might go back to the triangle. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, that might be a good slide to use if, if, if you guys are up for uh, Alexandra and Sarah and Florian, are you, are you up for giving this a shot of uh, how this could work? Yes. And, and, and Florian, does that, does that if, we, if we spend the rest of the, what have we got left now, about a little, about 40 minutes, if we spend maybe 15 minutes uh, getting uh, everybody engaged in, in using the model you've built, and then maybe leave half an hour or so for discussion. Is that a good use of time from your perspective? Yeah, happy to do so. Yeah, and, and, and uh, by the way, we should, we should also take the time to answer questions. Thank you, both. Um, so uh, you, you, the questions have been coming in on the chat, uh, as well as comments and congratulations. Um, and um, so uh, why, do, why, do we, why do we try one of these examples? Uh, first, so so Alexander, uh, Alexander we, we, we rehearsed one, uh, which is kind of a jokey, uh, but at the same time, it, it gives people a sense of how this works and, and to kind of model the behavior we can expect from everybody else. So, so, I, so Alexander said, So, what, what's your business model, Anthony? What's the business model for the flourishing enterprise innovation toolkit? So, I said, Our business model is to build community to enable people to take action to design and realize flourishing business models. And Alexander said. Well, that's a, that's a community platform right in the middle, number 11. That's number 11. So would anybody else like to, to try this for a business model they're familiar with or their own business model? Would you care to give us a uh, you know, two sentence elevator pitch description of your business model and have the team react by 
telling you which of their patterns they think you're using. Uh, if, if, if just start speaking one of you and we'll deal with it. Okay, I'll go, Anthony. Brilliant, okay. Uh, sorry to be late, folks. Hi there. Uh, this is, I, I came in at the very tail end of this. It looks fascinating. Um, uh, so um, what's interesting is the new company, uh, Critical Path Capital, uh, which is building a, uh, a, a private equity fund, a sustainability turnaround fund that will acquire uh, small and medium-sized companies, uh, transform their business model and operating practices through lean and green, um, uh, open books, uh, um, uh, entrepreneurship, and a number of other frameworks, uh, build capacity among the organization and exit with a sale to the employees. So the net product is a uh, 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 seriously sustainable business model company, companies owned by their employees. So where do we fit on the landscape? The first thing that comes to mind is financing, because that's what a private equity company does. So for sure, there's a bit of number two there. Uh -huh. uh, I heard a bit of uh, social mission, the idea of bringing companies and helping them turn around. Yeah. Um, very quickly, so that's one in eight. And there's 10. Because the exit will yeah. be employee owned the you know employee cooperative business yeah. that's yeah true so this this allows me to say another thing um about this is that we're talking about pattern groups so we're sort of at, at three different levels in the sense actually there's even four levels we didn't talk about this much in the paper but there's imagine an individual business that is unaware of its of its business model and then you have a business model and then you have business model patterns and of the patterns we have groups so we have four different levels here of, of recognizing. So it's pretty easy for us to say that a company is within one of these 11 groups because it's so, it's so in, in, encompassing. Uh, what's interesting is to go maybe one level further and look into the 45 different patterns and not groups, but patterns individually. Mm -hmm. And then you start getting a little more, even more color uh, and being able to say exactly within financing, what is the pattern that is interesting within financing? And, within social mission, which one is it? And within co-op, cooperative doesn't have many of them, to be honest. Cooperative is pretty just straight up cooperative. But yeah, um, um, and yeah so that's, that's, that's the point I wanted to make with that example where we have to understand that there's different levels going up and then there's different colors uh, side by side. Mm -hmm. So I really see this as an artistic uh, representation of business models. And, and as I said in the chat, this is a social construct. This is something that we are, it's, there's, an, there's a subjective aspect to all this is our interpretation of this phenomena. It's not something like physics where we can go measure it and you know, see the Higgs boson um, and know, without know, seeing the Higgs boson, we know that it's there. Because um, the, the way I see this triangle and to, to continue with my physics analogy is why isn't there anything in the G space and why isn't there anything in the, the uh, the f area there's very little patterns in the f area so it's not like physics where we're expecting to be able to explain the holes that are missing in the universe um i see this as a representation of what is today in the universe and maybe an opportunity to create something in the the g category the f category or even in the upper i category anyway so there's sort of this idea of uh, demonstrating opportunities that are that are not um, easy to comprehend. Maybe one additional comment. So you introduced these four levels on which we can look at business models and patterns. And um, so to add a little more complexity, um, it's also about combining the different patterns. So in the case we just listened to, I would say it's um, about financing mechanisms, as Alexandre said, it's also about social empowerment. It's maybe about cooperative ownership. And I think this whole thing really becomes interesting when you start combining the different patterns. And this brings us closer to the notion of pattern language. So you, you can see this, or can, you can read this triangle as a repository of patterns we found in the literature, but 
that's just the beginning. So the next step will really be to learn how to, how to combine these different patterns to create, but also to describe um, existing and maybe new business models. So in your case was really about um, combining different aspects of different patterns. So it's, it's not like I have a business and it fits just, you know, it's, it's, it's just one pattern that describes this business. I, I think it will mostly be the case that you will need different patterns to cover the varieties of the richness of, of, of real cases. Uh, yeah. And that's even more so present in sustainability. Sorry, Sarah. Uh, because, we're talk, because we're talking about, you know, we're, we're aiming towards sustainability in these companies and we have this uh, ideal, uh, we need to be touching more um, various patterns um, in, instead of just, you know, choosing razors and blades and saying we're going to, separate the materials from the, uh, the fixed product from the consumables, and we're just going to go and do that. If I take the Nespresso example, for example, uh, you know, Nespresso making these little capsules and, you know, everybody is hitting hard on them saying you guys are creating a lot of waste. Where's your environmental impact? So these companies that were seemed rather, you know, uni, uni focused because of sustainability in ambitions, we're offering them the opportunity to share the, the different elements of other levels of their patterns. Uh, just Sarah? one uh, aspect that I wanted to add is that that's why I'm actually quite grateful that Anthony is, has pro offered uh, or suggested this exercise because it shows that a crucial component is actually still missing when it comes to our pattern descriptions. And it's actually Anthony and Alexandra actually really pinpointed it through their own work is that the power of visualization and the key factor that's really still missing with these patterns and in that way, we also still deviate from the, largely from the work of Christopher Alexander's actually visualizing, sketching these individual patterns as that would also facilitate this exercise a lot. Um, Christopher Alexander sketched each of the patterns he identified through his research. And this is another component that probably will be added in the near future that all these patterns will be somewhat maybe sketched on a canvas or a framework or, or something of that sort to give it also an additional visual element, which would help. Um, this is something worth noting. Okay. I think there was someone in the chat who said that they wanted to suggest another business model. Yeah, Morris, I think that's your cue. Uh, yes, hi, thanks. Um, great presentation, by the way. I've been looking forward to hear it firsthand rather than just uh, reading it uh, about it. Um, the example I have is uh, probably straightforward, but it's a company I'm going to visit tomorrow uh, who um, openly espoused their uh, sustainability viewpoint. They are a not-for-profit organization, and uh, what they do is uh, they have uh, one, they have a group of volunteers uh, working with them. And secondly, what they do is they take what they call dormant goods, which are basically things that people would normally throw away, uh, things that have um, uh, very hard to, to sell or make good use of, like, say, um, used furniture, those type of items, household goods predominantly, uh, but also, for example, expired foods and things like that. Uh, not necessarily um, um, to throw away, but, but sort of not, not something you can sell in a shop. They take these items and uh, together with volunteers, they actually then hold regular sort of what we call here garage sales, uh, but consider it like a fair where they actually then sell these goods uh, to other people. And um, people pay obviously a reduced price to access uh, those goods, which are used goods. Um, but in doing so, they've got some real stats, which I've been discussing with them about, um, I think it's 3.3 uh, uh, million kilograms that they displace in landfill and uh, save so many hundreds of thousands of litres of water, etc. They've actually done the calculations to actually show uh, how uh, the impact of what they've been doing compared to traditionally what people have done with these um, items where they've normally literally just thrown them in the dump. So... Uh, they provide the transport services and the storage services uh, and so forth of getting these goods 
into basically like a, a warehouse where they then do a garage sale. Uh, so um, if it's not clear, just ask me. But um, uh, that's what I understand they do. And I'm actually going to visit them tomorrow. So I'm actually going on what they've been telling me so, thus far. Yeah, so my, my first take would be that's related to um, group four, which is um, around um, dealing with different approaches to, to closing different loops in terms of materials and energies and energy. And um, it, it could maybe relate to um, the pattern that's called next life sales, or it could also be about um, reusing. So this would require maybe a more detailed look at um, the quality and um, the, the products and if they are maybe refurbished or repaired a little bit. But, but for sure, it's, it's yes, related. They, Sorry? Yeah, they, they do uh, repair it. Uh, they have volunteer tradesmen. They do obviously have to pay for the materials uh, out of, out of uh, funding that they get, uh, community funding. But they do have uh, um, repairmen who come in on a voluntary basis and repair yeah. some of the materials. Yeah. So, 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 so they're not for profit, basically. Um, yeah, so, so and they rely would, on stuff. Yeah. yeah. So my guess would be something like next life sales or reuse in combination with, for example, um, micro distribution and retail. So because I think this model is maybe very locally oriented. It doesn't sound like they would set up global logistics and supply chains. So maybe this model is more locally oriented. So it could be about micro distribution, setting up micro distribution. And if you say it's kind of a nonprofit that's uh, more like a, like a community thing, you could, I don't know if it's also related to cooperative ownership, but, but this would be my first guess what might be in this model. Well, it's interesting you mentioned the thing about they local. They are very much local at this point, but actually the reason I'm going to see them tomorrow, they approach me, is they're looking to take this model that they have, this which they built over the last few years, and uh, just the other week they got, um, they won the... Um, it's like a mayor, mayor's award um, on the, you know, they were given an award for, for their efforts in, in um, reducing waste, et cetera. Um, they actually looking to take this model to other countries. Actually, that's why they, they approach me because um, they have had some success with it and they thinking, well, how, how can we um, conceptualize this into like a proper business model and then repeat this and do this in other places. But it does work very locally. I mean, even though you may do it in other countries, other cities, etc., it will still be fairly localized to, to those areas. You wouldn't be sending goods across, you know, from country to country or things yeah. like that. But uh, yes. So, so this is interesting because from a, a managerial point of view, from a consulting point of view, when you see that a company is very strong in the closing the loop um, and, and in one aspect, so you can see that the number four is more towards the ecology. And however, your business, um, let's say, challenge is to have a more economical business model, let's say, uh, to scale it, to make to bring it to other countries. So it's interesting to see how Right now, they're very strong in the number four, but maybe you can look opposite and see what are they missing. So now you can see at the opposite side of the triangle, is there something in one, two, seven, or even in 10 um, to round out their business model to make sure that they're well balanced? And that's something that I think uh, more and more in our, as we were talking, Florian was just talking about how we need to see the different combinations of business models. I think that this triangle now enables people to see in which direction they should start looking. So very quickly from four, the complete opposite is uh, two. So I'm not sure how they're how very. They... Yeah, sorry. No, yeah, you, I'm, I'm not sure ahead. how they're going to bring it at scale because um, the um, the logistics in different areas and, and the social, economic and cultural aspects would be very different. So for example, I'm, I mean, and one of the reasons they're talking to me is because I'm looking at say how this could maybe scale or, or, or be replicable more to the point, probably a better word into say Asia. Now the dynamics in Asia would be very different to how it is here in Australia in terms of, um, sourcing goods and even selling the goods and getting repair of, 
of materials and materials and repair, etc. So um, I think it's quite a challenging thing what they're considering, but um, you can't just replicate it. I think it, it needs to um, be really examined based on the context in each of the different areas, basically. So I think you're you're completely correct. My, 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 my point is saying that if you're strong in one area of the triangle, this becomes a tool to realize what are, your, uh, la what are you lacking. And, and just by looking at the triangle, you can see that if a company is strong at the, in the, you know, the four, where the f number four is in the H uh, zone, then maybe you should start looking at what's happening in the E zone in the forms of value creation to make sure that you have a well-rounded um, complementary uh, business model patterns. So uh, I, I, I'll uh, jump in here and make a, an observation. So one of our members who's not here today, unfortunately, is a gentleman by the name of Harry Stoddart. And um, about three years ago, and, and Morris and I were chatting about this a couple of weeks back, um, about three years ago, um, Harry and I did a little experiment, which I'd just like to relate to you because it, 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 it perfectly complements the findings of this uh, study that uh, uh, we've had presented today. Uh, and this is using flourishing business canvas. So what we what we wondered was um, if you take the patterns that were starting to appear in the literature at the time, and, and in this case it was Nancy Bolkins' uh, archetypes. Um, we were wondering uh, at the time there wasn't much discussion about whether these architect archetypes were complete uh, business models or whether they were parts of business models. And so we did a, um, an exercise with students at OCAD in the Strategic Foresight Innovation Program. We gave them the pattern descriptions from Bokka, gave them a flourishing business canvas, and then some case studies, uh, which we thought ma matched the patterns, and then asked them to describe the patterns on the, the, the case studies on the canvas, um, just based on the words that were written. So we had, a, we had one pattern that we, that was, we labeled using Nancy's, uh, I think, social enterprise, it was called, and another one which was close the loop for. Uh, and what we discovered is when you map the company's own descriptions of their business models based on the fact that they've come at it, as you just said, Alexander, from a particular zone, if I use your terminology, in, in this new model, what happens is all the stickies that describe their business model based on what they actually wrote basically fill up only one part of flourishing business canvas. So for example, the company that uh, we use as a case study that was very much in the, close, in the um, uh, closing the loop pattern uh, in, in this model, uh, mostly has stickies on the left-hand side of the flourishing business canvas. Uh, conversely, a pattern uh, which was much more social enterprise and much more orientated to people uh, was much more with stickies on the right-hand side of the canvas. Now, again, it wasn't that there were no stickies on the other part of the canvas because they, they obviously had to talk about their whole business model. Uh, but it was very interesting that that was what we uh, un unpacked in, in that exercise. We did that very informally uh, and... Um, uh, partly on the strength of that, when Peter Jones and I uh, wrote the uh, article that summarizes the strongly sustainable business model ontology that uh, Florian was uh, instrumental in getting published, um, we, um, we closed in the limitations and quick work section uh, by saying uh, that we really felt that there was a big piece of work to be done here uh, to actually attempt to use the strongly sustainable business model ontology or its practitioner version of the flourishing business canvas um, as, a, as a way of understanding, I think we may have even used the word as a taxonomy uh, for patterns of business models. Uh, and I, um, I'll stop at that point. I, I, I now could keep going in. Can I just make a comment on that? Yeah, but I, but I wanted to open it up for discussion because I've said a lot. Uh, yeah, Anthony, can I just add a comment there? Um, perhaps in, in terms of resilience, in terms of organization being resilient, uh, it may well be that having, um, uh, I, I guess, a distribution of patterns, if you want to use that word, or, or having basically a coverage, wider coverage, will make a company more resilient. I mean, this needs to be obviously established, needs to be tested, but um, that that could be something that could be examined, that sort of type of thing. So, so a company would have, you know, um, basically... Uh, some sort of coverage across uh, most of that triangle type of thing would be more resilient uh, well, compared to other companies. Any, anybody care to comment on that in terms of uh, their experience? Or? I'm just an idea I'm throwing out. So oh, that's brilliant. Thank you. Well, what do other people think? 
Florian, uh, how does that strike you as a hypothesis? Yeah, I would I would take it as a, as a, as, a, as a hypothesis um, which should be tested. So, um, and, and this is maybe one way to um, to to use the the patterns in scientific research to come up with these hypotheses, which which might be like what Morris suggested that the more patterns are combined, the more resilient an organization is getting, or there are specific combinations of patterns that make an organization resilient, but you could also think about theorizing the potential to scaling, which is your current problem, Morris, that maybe some pattern combination combinations are more likely to, to be scalable than other combinations. Um, so, you know, I'm just repeating myself, this is just a starting point. So I see it as a, as, as a new toy that we can play around <laughs> in different directions and then it's really it's a toy for practitioners, but also for researchers. And so I, I'm getting quite excited every time I see this triangle, so, because there's so much that, that could and should be done. Uh, maybe just as a, as a comment to, to your um, point or to your challenge, Morris. So this scaling thing is, is, is obviously beyond. So uh, we had this discussion in our team, if scaling itself is kind of a business model pattern, but as you can see from our list, we excluded scaling because Scaling is more like, like, like a general strategy or like a general task or challenge um, that can involve so many different patterns and which, which is beyond a simple description of a business model. Scaling is something um, that involves a lot of decisions related to finances, related to how to replicate an organization's activities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, but, but you could maybe think about doing a proper and sound analysis of the case uh, you're looking at and maybe you, you try to identify the core mechanisms so, so I, i'm aware that this notion of mechanism is tricky and not correct but i don't have a better term here you could maybe try to use the patterns to identify the core mechanisms that are characteristic of the case you're looking at and then in the next step the job would be to, 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 to analyze the new contexts, countries, geographical regions to which the organization would like to expand and then ask this question, is this the context in which these core mechanisms are still working? For example, if, if, it's, about, um, if it's about engaging local people um, who are working voluntarily to maybe repair the, the furniture, for example, is, if, if this is a core mechanism, then the question is, does the business model build on this mechanism function in, I don't know, some Australian city, somewhere in Germany, somewhere in the UK? And then this could be kind of a, of a, of a list of the must-haves of your business model that must be replicable. And if it's not replicable, then you don't go to Australia, UK, or to Germany. Or you change your I'd business like model. I'd like to add on that. Uh, we talked a lot about scaling uh, during this project. And one thing, it, there's a difference between scaling in the sense of going from one size to a bigger size and replicating. So if you yes. think of biomimicry, uh, you know, often cells, they don't just grow, they, they replicate. Uh, so, of course, by replicating, you have a greater geographical outreach. Uh, but there's a big difference between scaling and replicating. And... Um, and if we go back to originally to a pattern language and the architecture um, uh, idea, there's a difference between scaling a door, which at the level of a city would be an entryway into the city, and we're not replicating a door, uh, we're, we're not physically scaling a door at the size of a city, see what I mean? So uh, patterns sometimes have a, a better efficiency at certain scales, and at a bigger scale, it would be a different type of pattern. Uh, so that's another area where we can bring our work because I think that working in micro, you know, startups would probably use patterns, but it's so it's much easier for us to talk about these big companies. If I say again, Nespresso, this, you know, there's just saying the word, we understand very quickly what that business is about. But if we go back to the local, very small coffee shop, there might be micro pattern that we have more difficulty understanding today because we don't see them. They're not as easy to understand. Again, I'm going back to the fact that these business model patterns are social constructs. 
So, um, Sarah, I think uh, I, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, cut the conversation off there, although it is fascinating and I wish we had more time because we've only got 15 minutes left and I do want to give us a, a, a chance to just talk about next steps uh, a little bit here uh, based on Florian's uh, invitation uh, and observation that there's so much more to, to do because I, I strongly agree with that. Um, could, Sarah, could you just end your presentation and that way we can actually see, everybody can see everybody at the same time, I think. Zoom will oh, yeah, sure. change change mode on us when you end the presentation. Okay. You just have to stop the share. Okay, just stop the share. So what Sarah's doing that. Um, so as as Florian noted, uh, the uh, one of the uh, things that triggered this research uh, project uh, was meetings that we had here in uh, Toronto in uh, the spring of uh, February of 2014, where uh, Florian and quite a few other people came to Toronto for discussions around specifically what has now become the flourishing business canvas. And um, what we knew at the time was that we, uh, by in, if we're going to successfully introduce a new tool, um, we need to give the people using that tool as much help as possible uh, using that tool well. And so one aspect of using a tool like the flourishing business canvas as well is having a book of patterns that you can draw on uh, so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, so that you, put, uh, so obviously we, we, uh, having design principles like future fit is very helpful, but applying the design principles is tough work. Um, having patterns is, is much, much easier. And this is of course why Alexander, uh, Christopher Alexander uh, came up with this idea in this field of architecture because they have a similar problem conceptually. So um, with this piece of work that uh, uh, Florian and, and team have done, uh, and, I, and I should note just for transparency that both Florian and Alexander are in the core team for the Flourishing Business Canvas. So they've been very diligently and uh, doing this, this piece of work. work. Um, but I, I hope, uh, guys, you won't mind if I, I uh, be strong here for a moment. Um, the, the challenge with this piece of research um, is that it is based fundamentally descriptive science. Um, and descriptive science, of course, is extremely powerful. But all it can do is theorize and justify based on what is. So all the work of the experts, of course, is based on what the experts have experienced in the world, which is what exists. We know today there is not a single strongly sustainable flourishing company on the planet, which is because we do not have a strongly sustainable flourishing society in which that company could be viable. So the question for us, if we're putting out a canvas that is meant to help people design businesses that will be viable, and in fact will help to bring about a world that is strongly sustainable and flourishing, what advice do we provide the users of that tool in terms of patterns? So the hypothesis we've been operating under is that the patterns that are described in this piece of research are likely necessary, but not sufficient. The question is, in order to be able to provide advice for people who truly are intending their businesses to contribute to the possibility of flourishing, what, how do we construct those patterns? Because descriptive science isn't going to do it. We're moving now into design science um, because we want to construct something which does not yet exist. Um, and um, so th this is the big conversation I, I would like to open here, is, is how as a community committed to strongly sustainable, strong sustainability as we are, by bringing about something that does not yet exist um, with a normative goal. Again, things that descriptive science doesn't do. How do we proceed? And who wants to proceed? And Bo and uh, Nicole as our new community animators who I introduced earlier, um, for the first time as a community, we now have some people who could help us with the mechanics of initiating such a project. Um, up to this point, it's been very much self-organization, which is a lot of work. Uh, now we've got a little bit of help available from Nicole and Bo uh, to convene, to um, facilitate discussion, to get a basic sense of a, a scope for a project degree, uh, etc. Um, I'll put a deadline on this as well. Um, the uh, Emerging out of the fog, uh, we have a plan. Uh, I think Eric, uh, you're here. Eric is our new project and program manager for the uh, Enterprise Innovation Toolkit, the toolkit that contains the canvas. Uh, and uh, we are, we'll be announcing soon a revised plan for the project. We think we're 
ready to move forward. So the book that describes the canvas, uh, tentatively we want to publish that book in the summer of 2020, which means the crowdfunding to build the community to write the book will be happening next summer, uh, which means we'll be write, starting to write the book, including the chapter on patterns uh, in the fall, starting in the fall of next year. So this research to build what will go into that chapter is now urgent. Uh, so we've got a fantastic foundation in the research we've just heard about. Uh, now we have to move it forward uh, from, if, if you don't mind me saying, weekly sustainable patterns to strongly sustainable flourishing patterns. So that's the challenge I'm throwing out. Who wants to have at it first? I'm ready to say something about that. I think that um, before we talk about patterns, which are recognizable once you have multiple specimens that share a characteristic, I think that because this is so uh, new, uh, this idea of strongly sustainable, resilient, flourishing, um, I think that right now there will be little re representations, but we're probably immature to see them as patterns yet because they're so alone and distributed and, and um, maybe again, they're at a different scale and we're not used to seeing them at, at that, uh, to see those connections so far. So I think that to, to talk about strongly sustainable patterns is definitely the future, but I think that we're, we're ahead of ourselves in the sense that we start, first have to start talking about Elemental, elemental examples of business model, business model examples. Um, and, and I wonder if, again, another thing is that because this idea of pattern is so novel and right now we're just you know, recognizing one pattern and uh, sorry, one element and another element and another element that creates one pattern. And then we see again, that represented in another area and then together we can combine those. So if I go now to strongly, I think that we're, again, we have to go back to the base and start going back to the sim simple, you know, this is something that's going in the right direction. This is another element that's going in the right direction before we can talk about a pattern. Other comments, ob ob observations? I, I could weigh in, but I'm gonna let other people go. So, um, just one, you know, you need two legs to, to stand um, as, you, as a human being. So you need two legs. You, you cannot stand on one leg, right? Not for long. <laughs> Not for long, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think, um, the <laughs> you, you, Alexander, you're a sportsman, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I think... Um, that we did not talk about the second leg that we need in close connection and direct connection to the work on patterns, which is to figure out how to, how to assess, how to estimate, how to evaluate the outcomes of patterns. Or let's say, does a company that is using some of the closing the loop patterns, is it really performing better in ecological terms? Can you measure this? compared to companies that don't use this pattern, as long as we're not able to at least estimate effects. You know, even, even the, the best ambitions for strongly sustainable patterns, it's just theory. So to me, the patterns are then really a relevant, practically impactful tool if we combine it with approaches to measuring effects of using these patterns. And I'm not talking about um, hard numbers only it's it's you know just an estimation would would would, would offer some direction it's like in, in 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 prototyping so you have a prototype you get feedback you improve you get feedback you improve so this is kind of a of a routine or an approach that's missing to to really have an have an effect but if, if we don't have this it's, it's all theory so um so, Mike, Mike uh, actually, Morris, do you, you want to uh, add something? I know you and I had a chat before the meeting about this, you, but you're being quiet now. So, do you want? To, would you like to add something quickly? Well, um, thanks, Anthony. Yeah, um, I think um, you're absolutely right, uh, Florian. Um, we need some way of assessing um, 
the sustainability or strong sustainability as of a company as it applies to any particular business model, which as you know, is something we've discussed also previously. So one of the things I spoke with Anthony about is, is um, perhaps getting um, um, a group or subgroup going actually within, uh, within the SSBMG uh, where people who have interest or expression of, of interest in this topic uh, can look at uh, working on this particular thing. I mean, I'm just throwing this this out there right now, but that would be an idea of getting um, some of the, you know, some of the people who have uh, knowledge and, and interest in pursuing this aspect uh, and looking at assessing um, the sustainability uh, strong sustainability, I guess, of uh, business models. So, um, and and part of that would be business model, re uh, you know, recognition, pattern recognition. Th thanks, uh, Sarah Undine. Uh, do you have anything, Sarah, in particular? Uh, and Undine, uh, comments, thoughts. Where do we go from here? Um, I can just, again, reiterate, I still think that the visualization aspect is still missing when it comes to the patterns. I think it would really kind of make them even stronger than they are at present. Um, especially in my master's thesis, what I did is I actually put models on a business model canvas and it really helped with comprehension. So I think that that would be maybe one of the steps to do in the near future to visually represent the patterns because that way you could also more, in my opinion, show how uh, different um, business models are oftentimes comprised of numerous patterns at the same time. Um, and I think that it's this visual element that's still missing. And I think that will especially help in the sense that we would like to use this as a tool on business model innovation if you can actually have this visual component. So that's something I'd like to add. Um, I want to uh, second that, Sarah. I definitely think the visual aspect is important, but what canvas are we modeling it to because you kind of have to model it to a canvas to have it be a visual representation so alexander you've done some of this in your previous work on the triple layer trip sorry i'm going to get this wrong triple layer, that's tri triple layer canvas that's it <laughs> triple layer canvas and i mean i i would love, I mean, I would love to see that work being mapped out on the flourishing canvas because that's the canvas we use a lot, but I often refer back to the triple layer canvas and the patterning work you did from a visual perspective um, on your canvas because canvas, it's so helpful, um, especially working with earlier stage organizations and helping them find business models. I mean, that's, that's really where I see the power of the work because I'm working with earlier stage organizations. So, yeah, that's my feedback. So we are about to time out, uh, unfortunately, uh, but I, I want to see um, if uh, Nicole and Bo were to do a doodle poll uh, to convene a, a meeting, maybe 90 minutes, uh, sometime, I don't know if it'll be before the end of the year or early next year, uh, to uh, bring together those of us who would like to uh, accelerate our progress on, on this. Um, is this something, I, I think we have the ability, if you bring up the, uh, I've never tried to use this functionality in the meeting before, if you bring up the list of participants, uh, below uh, the list of participants, we've got some buttons like yes, no, go slower, faster, thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, so maybe we'll do a, um, a, a yes, no thing, and, and Nicole and Bo can try and capture people's interest here. Would people like to hit the yes or no button when you click on the, the manage participants? So you see the list of participants down the bottom, it has yes, no, I've got two yeses so far, who's interested? I guess I should click the yes button as well. And you, we can see in the, in the chat who's voted yes, so this is not a, uh, this is not a private thing. Uh, and, it, and if you can't figure out the technology, then just put a message in the, uh, in the chat. And that way it'll get captured because we do save the chat. With this. Okay, so we've definitely got a, a, a number of people who would be interested. Um, it, uh, fantastic. And um, 
Uh, Nicole Bo, do you have that uh, documented? Who said yes? Uh, no, but I'm, I'm clearing it. I'm going to clear and do another one. Nicole, you, you did Nicole have to go? She's had to go. Okay, so I won't do it then. Um, so, uh, se second question, uh, maybe just do a visual show of hands. Um, timing. Um, let's let's do. Are those people who voted yes? Are we saying before Christmas? Let's now. Let me let me express my preference by the way I ask the question. Uh, who would like to do that after Christmas? Hands up for those of us who voted. Actually, we hand them over. I need to close this chat a little bit. I can't see everybody. <laughs> okay, who, who put their hands up for after Christmas? One, two, Florian, Alexander. Okay, so it looks like Morris, you, did you vote? Sorry? Did you vote after Christmas? Well, I'm voting for before Christmas. Oh, you're not possible. <laughs> okay, yes, you're, that's true. You, you have a sense of urgency here. Okay, I, I, I fear, however, it's going to be after Christmas, but we can do it very soon after Christmas. Uh, so, um, expect, for those of you who voted, expect um, uh, Nicole and Bo to uh, send a, an email uh, with a doodle poll in it to pick a date uh, for, a, for a next discussion. Um, and we'll try and figure out, maybe we'll start a conversation in the comments under this meeting's post in LinkedIn. Although, yes, LinkedIn sucks and it has got worse and we're moving off it. Uh, but we haven't figured it out yet, uh, parenthesis. Um, so um, let, let's try and have a conversation there. And that would also, or maybe we'll start a new conversation, maybe better. Um, and that would circle in the possibility that people who were not able to be here today physically, but will listen to the recording, uh, can put their hands up and, and get involved in, in some way, shape or form. Uh, I see Eric smiling and typing, and I fear that it's coming in my direction. No, it's not. Okay, good. Um, so uh, we, we are now just a few minutes past the hour. Does anybody else have any, uh, uh, Florian or Sarah or Alexander, do you have any other closing comments, thoughts? Thanks for your interest. Yeah, well, this, this, how could we not be interested? Sorry, Sarah, go ahead. Uh, no, I didn't have much to add apart from the fact that it's really great that um, we had a chance to present our work here today. Definitely was a bigger audience than at the Academy of Management. <laughs> so it's very uh, flattering and I'm grateful. Thank you. We, we, we are the future. We're strongly sustainable. They're not. Yeah. I've noticed, yes. <laughs> it just thanks to, to you for listening and also thanks for your inspiration. So, you know, without this conversation which is now going on for five years i think um these things wouldn't happen so it's it's really important to talk and you know that we needed i would say one or two years to really understand each other because you were talking about design and i just what the heck is this boy talking about but but now it's it's getting better and better and I think just in investing some time and in learning to understand different people from different disciplines uh, is, is really what's driving the things we're doing now. So thanks a lot for, for this conversation and for your patience. Fantastic. And th thanks for staying engaged, despite the fact that those conversations sometimes be challenging. But we managed to smile through it. So this is, this is yeah, sure. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close by announcing next month's meeting um, and, and to, as usual, uh, make sure that everybody understands this is, a, uh, this is a, a series of meetings that we have every month uh, for our members, by our members. So. Uh, when you see me put up a slide like this, this is because somebody put up their hand and, and came to me and increasingly to Bo and Nicole and said, I, I've got something important to say, I want to say it. Uh, sometimes I go and get them and tell them that they have to, but often it's the other way around and that's, that's the way it should be. So um, many of us know that there is a strong connection, just to tee up next month's meeting, um, many of us know that there is a strong connection between product and business model innovation uh, and, that, uh, and also know, understand that uh, the methods we use to design business models and the, the methods we use to design products uh, must be integrated in some way in order that uh, we avoid unintended consequences and enable uh, flourishing. So uh, I was absolutely delighted this time last year to meet uh, in person uh, at Dr. Jan Detten and then both Francesco Fuzzi and Jan Detten and uh, earlier this year in Ghent uh, in Belgium. Uh, they have developed uh, what 
from my knowledge, is the first um, approach to applying backcasting to product design uh, that I've come across. Uh, and um, uh, this presentation that I'm citing here is the one that they gave uh, when they shared that at the Relating System Thinking and Design Network conference in Oslo uh, last, uh, uh, last October. And so they're going to reprise their talk um, at this uh, meeting. And we actually have already had a, a first meeting of members of this group about taking this work forward uh, as a group with a particular focus on flourishing product design, but integrating it with business model design. Uh, we have two experiments underway right now uh, going on in two different universities in Europe. Uh, one in um, Sweden, where I will be in a few weeks' time to uh, be at the closing of this uh, first course called Integrated Product and Business Model Design for Flourishing. Um, and we've got another uh, program. So that program is, being, is using this research in the classroom with, in case study based uh, work. And then the second course is at the University of Ghent, where uh, Dr. Tuzi and uh, Detan are uh, applying their own research, but now also integrating the Flourishing Business Canvas. Uh, both the people in Sweden and the people in Ghent are first explorers of Flourishing Business Canvas. So we're, we're really trying to try and figure this out. So again, uh, there are others on this call uh, who were in the original call earlier this uh, year. And so again, hoping Bo and Nicole, uh, following next month's presentation, we can have a, a second meeting of this group uh, to try and figure out uh, you know, what did we learn from these uh, classroom experiences and then how to uh, move all of that forward um, uh, as well as a, as a group. So uh, hopefully that's got people excited and interested uh, and we'll see you all uh, on the second Tuesday in December and I can't remember the date and Morris will tell me that no it's not on a Tuesday it's on a Wednesday damn it I'm in a different day than you all are uh, but anyway we'll figure all of that out. So thank you all very much. Uh, Thank you for sticking with us, those in uh, faraway time zones. Uh, and uh, for those watching on the video, uh, please let us know you watch the video uh, by going into the LinkedIn group and, and putting in a comment saying thank you for the video. Uh, that will be very useful feedback. Okay, thank you all, everybody, very much. Have a wonderful day, evening, night, depending on where you are. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. Thank Bye -bye. You. Bye, -bye. Bye bye. Florian, can we get your slides? Uh, they, they were, they're going to be shared, Gil, um, and I, actually, Gil, if you could stay on the call just for a moment, I'd love to just chat with you briefly, privately, if it's convenient. Was that to me? Yes, it was. Sure. Yeah, happy to. Brilliant, thank you. So the slides will be shared, as always. They're in the, they'll be in the Google Drive momentarily, along with the recording, which will be there in about an hour's time. Wonderful. Thank you. On with the, the link is shared in, in the LinkedIn group. Mm -hmm. And, and I can share it with you privately. Okay. okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank Bye. you.